youth group here at the church. Yeah, go youth group. Go team. It's great. And first of all, I want to start by saying that I love my wife so much. And here's one of the reasons that I love my wife. And that is, I found out that I was going to be teaching this Sunday, last Saturday. So, what, six, six days ago? And so, from Saturday to Thursday, this last Thursday, I was praying, I was thinking, and I couldn't come up with anything. And I even remember I was, uh, I was talking with Ben and Rihanna in the office, and I was like, I don't, I don't know what I'm going to teach on. And I like pitched them some ideas. So Thursday night, I'm just like in panic mode because we have Live Nativity Friday. I work Saturday morning, Live Nativity again Saturday evening. It's like I am running out of time. And so I'm talking to my wife, and she kind of poses this question. I forget how you said it, though, exactly. But it was basically along the lines of, what does God want you to teach? And is this about God or is this about you? And then I really checked my heart and I realized that as I was preparing and as I was beginning to put all this together, I was, when, when I first started, I was more worried about if I don't do well, what is the church going to think about me? Right, how are they going to view me? And then after Maddie asked me that question, I began to really change my heart and consider regardless of how I do, regardless of how well I speak or how well the sermon is put together, how is the church going to view Christ? And how are they going to view not only Christ's birth, but all of the prophecy that led up to that, and then Christ's death? And so this morning, the title of my sermon is The Expectation of a Nation. And we are going to be talking about from creation all the way till Christ's birth, prophecy that surrounded his life and this buildup of what this nation of Israel was looking for in their Messiah. And so my core verse this morning that we're going to keep coming back to is in Jeremiah 23, starting in verse five. So I'm going to ask that you turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 23, starting in verse five. And once you've gotten there, I'm going to ask that you stand with me for the reading of God's word. Jeremiah 23, starting in verse 5. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. And he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell secure. This is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when you shall no longer say, as the Lord lives who brought up the people out of the land of Israel, but... As the Lord lives who brought up and led the offspring of the house of Israel out of the north country and out of the countries where he had driven them, then they shall dwell in their own land. Let's pray. Father God, I'm just so thankful for your plan that took hundreds of years that brought us to this beautiful birth of Christ. And so I pray this morning that that you will speak to our hearts wherever we're at and that regardless of our understanding of Christ or our understanding of you that we will be challenged and that we will be encouraged. So Lord, I pray uh, that this morning as we study the history behind Christ's birth We grow in a deeper appreciation for the life that he lived and the way in which he died and the reason for which he died. So Lord, I pray that you bless this morning. And regardless of how well I do, I pray that the church is encouraged and that I am encouraged as we view the most important birth in history. And we pray all this in your son's holy and precious name. 
Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Haven't, haven't messed up yet. Haven't committed heresy yet. That's right. Think, I like that. Think positive. Okay. So we started in Jeremiah, and now we're going to jump back all the way to creation. And I'm going to try and do, to the best of my ability, a really quick history lesson from Genesis all the way to Matthew. And I'm going to miss a lot because I don't have that much time. But bear with me. So jumping back to Genesis 1, chapter 1, we have the creation story. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then God created all things. And then God created man in his own image. God gave man the ability to empathize, to feel sadness, to feel joy. And then in Genesis 3, at the beginning of Genesis 3, we have the fall. Man is deceived by the serpent. Man desires his own way, turns away from what God has called him to, and breaks that perfect union between God and man. And then right after this happens, God gives man a curse because of his sin. And in the midst of this curse, we have our first look at Christ. We have our first glimpse of this remedy for what we did, for the, for the relationship that we broke through our sin, God has already placed a way back to himself. And that starts in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And it reads, I will put enmity between you, Satan, and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. The first he is Christ. The second he is Satan. So Satan will bruise Christ's heel. He will cause him physical suffering, which we see in the crucifixion and which we see through his entire life of being persecuted. But Christ will ultimately have the ultimate victory when he will crush the serpent's head, when he will bruise his head. Christ will deliver that fatal blow. But see, we don't know any of this yet. In hindsight, you have 20-20 vision, right? We, this is all history to us. It's been written down for us. So we can go back and read Genesis and then read the whole life of Christ and connect all the dots. But when this was given to Moses... He didn't really know what to expect. All he knew was that there was a remedy coming. And that one day, there was going to be a man who was going to crush the head of Satan. And so now we jump forward into Genesis chapter 17, verse 7, uh, no, 17, 7. Genesis 17, 7. And we come across this man named Abraham. And Abraham has this covenant of circumcision with God. And God makes a covenant with Abraham. So Genesis 17 verse 7. And I, God, will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring. After you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojourns and the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. I will be their God. So Genesis 3.15, we have this promise of some sort of a remedy. And then we see this next step as God makes a covenant with Abraham, and this is essentially the promise that he's going to make Abraham a mighty nation. This is God's promise of the nation of Israel. But Abraham doesn't know this, but he still continues in faith because he and his wife are both advanced in years. They are well beyond the age of having children. But God has given him this promise. He's given him the promise of offspring and a nation through that offspring. 
And so God makes good on his promise and fulfills it in Genesis chapter 21, starting in verse 12. We have the birth of Isaac. So starting in verse 12, it says, But God said to Abraham, Do not be displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for through Isaac shall your offspring be named. Now, we kind of jumped in the middle of that story. What happened? Abraham and Sarah got tired of waiting. They got impatient. And so they took matters into their own hands. And so Sarah said, Abraham, take my servant. Have a child with her so that we could have offspring. And so they did. And what was her name? Hagar, right? Can anybody verify that? Hagar? Okay, good. This is off the top of my head. Don't want to commit heresy to you. So, Sarah gives Hagar to Abraham, says, give us a nation. Like, I'm too old. I can't do it. And so, they have a child, and that child's name is Ishmael. And through Ishmael, we have another huge kingdom, another huge people group. But we're not going to talk about that. That is a whole nother lesson. So... <laughs> Finally, God fulfills his promise to Abraham. I'm going to make you a mighty nation through your offspring. But see, the problem is Abraham thought, okay, if God's going to do it, but he's not doing it yet, so I better do it. But that's not the way it works. So he messed it up. But God came in and said, I'm still going to make a mighty nation through you, even out of your disobedience. And it is going to be through Isaac. So through Isaac, God gives Abraham a son. And through Isaac, God, God's promise is fulfilled. And then from Isaac, Isaac has Jacob. And then Jacob has his 12 sons. And the most important son that we normally talk about is Joseph. And through Joseph, this nation of Israel is delivered into Egypt. Joseph is sold into Egypt. He rises through the ranks. His brothers come, forget who he is. They don't know that it's Joseph. They thought that he's dead somewhere. And then Joseph reveals who he is. He unites his family. He brings his family into the nation of Israel. And there they live and there they prosper. But they prosper so greatly that the Egyptians fear that the Israelites are going to overthrow them because generations passed and nobody really remembers who Joseph is. And nobody really remembers how all these Israelites came to the land of Egypt. All they know is this is a big people group and they could overthrow us. So they throw them into slavery. The Egyptians enslave the Israelites for sake of suppressing them out of fear. And so they live that way for hundreds of years. And then God brings Moses into the scene. And through Moses, God delivers his nation of Israel into this promised land. This land that God promised Abraham. And so they are delivered into the nation of Israel. And they establish this nation of Israel. And then they have judges. And then... The nation of Israel cries out in 1 Samuel, we want to be like all other nations. Give us a king. They cry out to Samuel. And Samuel goes to the Lord and says, this is what they want. They want to be like all other nations. And God says, go ask them again. And they cry out, we want to be like all other nations. Give us a king. The irony in that they didn't see that God the Father was that king. They had their king already but they missed it. And so they desired, we want to be like all other nations. And so God says, okay. And instead of the nation of Israel allowing God to choose who this king is going to be, they chose who this king was going to be. And so the first man-chosen king of Israel was Saul. And things did not go very well with Saul. But God anointed David. And so David, who was anointed by God, who was the son of Jesse, begins to grow in popularity. And after 
David defeats Goliath and after he wins incredible military battles, the women in the streets start singing, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. And Saul grows jealous of David and says, I want this kid gone and goes so far as trying to spear David and goes so far as trying to spear Jonathan, Saul's son, David's best friend. See, Jonathan knew that David was God's anointed and because he knew that, he, he gave David his bow and his staff and his sword and his armor. He gave David everything. He, he essentially promised David my inheritance. Here you go, David. You are God's anointed. I am not, and I acknowledge that. But Saul was so power hungry, he didn't want to let that go. But eventually God, like he promised David, sets David as king of Israel. And when David becomes king of Israel, God promises David an eternal kingdom. Through David will this eternal kingdom grow. Through his bloodline will this Messiah essentially come. And so with that, let's just recap really quick. I'm just going to say names. So God creates Adam. Adam sins. God creates the remedy. God promises a nation to Abraham. God delivers on that promise through Isaac. Isaac has Jacob. Jacob has Joseph. Joseph delivers the nation of Israel to Egypt after being sold into slavery. Moses delivers the nation of Israel back into the promised land. The nation of Israel is established. David is now our first God-chosen legitimate king of Israel. And it is through David that we have this promise of a Messiah, this son of David, which is mentioned all throughout the New Testament. And that brings us to Jeremiah, this core verse that we started in. And I just want to jump back there really quick, back to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 23 5 through 8. It reads, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. And then we read also in Psalm 132, verse 11, that this promise, this oath that God swore to David, is it's coming. It is coming true. And then in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, we have God's new covenant with the nation of Israel, this covenant of grace. And so in hindsight, once again, we see where all of this is leading. But this nation of Israel doesn't. They don't know what this end game really looks like. All they know is they are expecting some sort of a Messiah. And so as we go through all of this history, we have just covered hundreds of years of Israeli history. You have to think the anticipation of, oh, please bring this Messiah. We're, we're waiting. And then things really heat up when the Romans come into play. And the Romans have their vast empire, the, the known world at the time. And it is under that Roman oppression that the Israelites are just waiting for not just a king, but a king who's going to come in power and a king who's going to come and overthrow the Romans. That is what they were expecting. And that is what they were waiting for. And this brings us to David's Davidic line. And I don't want to talk about this just for a little bit and what's really interesting about it and the hiccup that we could run into when it comes to David's or Jesus's Davidic line. And so we're actually going to read two genealogies, parts of the Bible that we normally just skip over, right? We get to Matthew 1 and it's like, oh, I could just skip these first 23 verses, don't need to need those, and then just jump right into his birth. 
but that's what we're going to do. We're going to read Mary's genealogy, and then we're going to read Joseph's genealogy, and then we're going to compare the two. So, starting with Mary's, turn with me to Luke chapter 3, starting in verse 23. Luke chapter 3, starting in verse 23. All right. Now bear with me, okay? Because some of these names are uh, different than what, from what I'm saying. All right. Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years of age, being the son, as was supposed, of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Ma- uh, Mat- Mathet, the son of Levi, the son of... Melchi, the son of Janai, the son of Joseph, the son of Matthias, the son of Amos, the son of Nahum, the same, the son of Elsie, the son of Nagai, the son of Maath, the son of Matathias, the son of Semyon, the son of Josek, the son of Jodah, the son of Jonan, the son of uh, Risa, the son of Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, the, sh- the son of Neri, the son of Melchi, the son of Adi, the son of Kassam, the son of Elmadam, the son of Ur, the son of Joshua, the son of Eleazar, the son of Joram, the son of Mathet, the son of Levi, the son of Simeon, the son of Judah, the son of Joseph, the son of Jonam, the son of of Elkim, the son of Malaya, the son of Mena, the son of Mat- Matatha, the son of Nathan, the son of David, the son of Jesse, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz, the son of Salah, the son of Nashan, the son of Aminadab, the son of Admin, the son of Arni, the son of Hezron, the son of Perez, the son of Judah, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, the son of Terah, the son of Nahor, the son of Sergat, the son of Ru, the son of Peleg, the son of Eber, the son of Shelah, the son of Canaan, the son of Arphaxed, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalil, the son of Canaan, the son of Enos, the son of Sheth, the son of Adam, the son of God. How did I do? Was that decent? Okay. So, that is Mary's genealogy. Mary, the mother of Christ. That takes us all the way back to Adam. Why is that important at all? Every single name in the Old Testament, every single name in genealogies is there for a reason. They are there to not only prove Christ's legitimate claim to the throne, being this Messiah from David, but it also gives validity to the Bible at all. There there are kings in these genealogies, there are men in these genealogies that archaeologists have found they have found real tablets with these real men in the proper location. So these genealogies are very, very valuable. So here's a question that I want to ask, and that is, knowing the story of Christ's birth, we know that Joseph was not the biological father of Christ, right? So why include his genealogy at all? And we are going to read it. Hopefully we get through it pretty good. And then we're going to talk about it. And we're going to compare them. So, Joseph's genealogy we're going to find in Matthew chapter 1, starting in verse 1. So go ahead and turn with me there. Matthew chapter 1, starting in verse 1. All right. I've got got to prep myself. Okay. Okay. Verse 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob. 
Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah, the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez, the father of Hezron, and Hezron, the father of Ram, and Ram, the father of Aminadab, and Aminadab, the father of Nahashan, and Nahashan, the father of Salmon, Salmon, and Salmon, the father of Boaz, and Rahab, and Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David, the king. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, and Abijah, the father of Asaph, and Asaph, the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram, and Joram, the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah, the father of Jotham, and Jotham, the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh, the father of Amos, and Amos, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah, and his brothers, at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And I actually want to stop there just for a moment. And we're going to jump back into Second Chronicles and find out what this hiccup is in Joseph's genealogy and why having both genealogies are so important. So, in Second Chronicles chapter 36, starting in verse 9. Second Chronicles chapter 36, starting in verse 9. And it reads, Jehoiachin was 18 years old when he became king, and he reigned three months and ten days in Jerusalem, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. In the spring of the year, King Nebuchadnezzar sent and brought him to Babylon with the precious vessels of the house of the Lord, and made his brother Zedekiah king over Judah and Jerusalem. So, this man, Jehoiachin, or some people call him different names. So there's Jeconiah, or Kona, as is found in a verse, or Jehoiachin. They're the same person. And this man, I'm going to call him Jeconiah, just that's kind of how I understand him in my own mind. This man and his father, Jehoiakim, both had no regard for God's law. I believe it's, I believe it's Jeremiah. Through Jeremiah, God spoke to Jeremiah and said, take this word, this word of the Lord, and take it to the king. And so they wrote it out, and the king would have his scribe read a few columns and then he would cut it off with a knife and throw it in the fire. And then he'd have him read a few more columns and then he'd cut it off with a knife and then throw it in the fire. And so this king had no regard for God's law or what God had to say to him. And so out of that, God curses Jeconiah and says, no one through your bloodline will sit on the throne. But we see Jeconiah in Joseph's genealogy. So how do you reconcile this then? Well, as we already kind of stated, Joseph is not the birth father to Jesus. So when you take both Joseph and Mary's genealogies, Joseph gives Christ the legal right to the throne because nobody really cared who your mother's father was. They cared who your father's father was. So because Joseph had this legal right to the throne, it gave Christ a legitimate right to the throne. But because Christ's bloodline is through Mary back to David, you bypass this curse that God had given Jeconiah. So, with that, we come to this place of hundreds of years of buildup to this birth of Christ. And I don't want to talk too much about the birth of Christ because Dana and Bob are going to be talking about that next week. What I want to talk about is Christ's birth 
is significant because of his death. Because of the way he died and what he died for, that is what makes Christ's birth worth celebrating every single year. And that is what makes Easter worth celebrating every single year. So Christ's birth is made exponentially more important because of his death and the manner in which he died. His being betrayed by a friend was prophesied in Psalm 41, verse 9. His being sold for 30 pieces of silver was prophesied in Zechariah 11, 12. His sufferings being for others was prophesied in Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 6. His being nailed to the cross was prophesied in Psalm 22, 16. And the fact that not a bone of his should be broken was prophesied in Exodus 12, 46 and Psalm 34, 20. And Paul has a really, really good recap of all of this in Acts chapter 13. And so I want to turn to Acts chapter 13 and just read what, what he said. Um, it's, yeah. I'm going to try and not read all of it, but it's going to be hard not to. Okay, so Acts chapter 13, starting in verse 13. Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But they went on from Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. After reading from the law of the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So Paul stood up and motioning with his hands said, Men of Israel, and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with up, uplifted arm, he led them out of it. And about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. All this took about 450 years. And after that, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king. And God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when we had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. Of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus, as he promised. Before his coming, John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all people of Israel, and as John was finishing his course, he said, What do you suppose that I am? I am not he. No, but behold, after me one is coming, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham and those among you who fear God to us has been sent the message of this salvation. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers because they did not recognize him, nor understand the utterance of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilling, fulfilled them by condemning him. And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus, as also it is written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore, he says in another psalm, you will not let your holy one see corruption. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. 
but he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not freed by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest you say to the prophets should come about, look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe in, even if one tells it to you. As they went out, the people begged them these things, that they might be told the next Sabbath. And after the meeting, the synagogue broke up. <coughs> Many Jews and devout converts of Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowd, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was spread throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city, stirring up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. So that was a lot. That was a very big passage. And I hope that you were able to stick with it. Because what Paul did is after the death and resurrection and ascension of Christ, Paul is basically going on mission trips. He's going from synagogue to synagogue. He's taking this gospel truth of who Christ was from Genesis 3.15 all the way to Matthew 1.1. All of that was a promise from God to humanity of this coming Messiah. And over hundreds of years, countless kings, judges, and prophets, God sustained this nation of Israel to bring us this one boy. God's own son. If you could almost break up the Bible according to when Jesus shows up, right? You have creation. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit all create everything. Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God. And then you have Genesis 3, 15. We have the first glimpse at Christ coming. And then from Genesis 3.15 all the way to Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, we have countless promises and God being faithful to the nation of Israel and God sustaining the nation of Israel and God delivering the nation of Israel from countless enemies and from multiple, what would you call it? Not not banishments, exiles. They were taken from their land and then they were put back. Then they were taken again and then they were put back. And all through that, God remembered his promise that he gave humanity in Genesis 3.15. You have to really consider the nation of, of, of it, uh, oh, the nation of Israel and how long it took for that promise to be seen in the birth of Christ. And then we have the life of Christ, where as in the book of John, we read that all of the things he did could not be recorded in all the books in the world. There's no way you could have recorded everything that Christ did. 
And in Christ, we have this beautiful thing, this hypostatic union. Completely God, completely man, brought into one being. And it is through that man that we have any means of being reconciled back to God and repairing that relationship that we have with God that we broke in Genesis 3.15. Because as soon as that sin was committed, God had already thought to the end and God already had a plan in place. And so we have Christ's birth, which is just the most fantastic thing. And it is so appropriate that we celebrate it once a year. But it's inappropriate that there are far too many people who are more concerned with what they're getting on December 25th versus who was born that morning or that night. I don't know what time of day he was born. But just really consider just think about how that birth changed our world. It changed our calendar changes the music that we listen to for two months out of the year. But ultimately, through that birth and through that child, it should change the way we live. Because of the way he lived and the way he died and what he died for. Because there are far too many people who only hear Jesus' name twice a year and all they know is he was born on December 25th and he died sometime around May. And then he was raised again. And that's about as far as they get. And they don't investigate his life. And they don't investigate what he was really all about. And they don't investigate the promise that he gave to us when he did leave. Because he said, I am coming again. I'm going to send a helper. God sent the Holy Spirit woo, that came down 40 days after Christ's ascension on the day of Pentecost. So let's think about God's faithfulness in all of this. From Genesis 3.15, it took hundreds of years, but God made good on what he said. And 2,000 years ago, God said, Christ said, I am coming back. And I can promise you this. He has given me no reason to doubt that he is coming back. So when we celebrate his birth, celebrate it. Let there be joy. Because there's so much joy in the birth of Christ. And the ultimate joy is because of his death and what he did on the cross. Because what he did on the cross is allow us to have that relationship with God that he's hardwired all of us to have. And Christ's death is made important because of his resurrection. And his resurrection is made important because of his ascension and the fact that he is coming back. And that he is going to come back and he is going to establish that eternal kingdom. And he is going to sit at the right hand of God. And we are going to be fellow heirs with Christ. And we are going to get to inherit what he has done. 
and what he has offered us. Not because of how good you are, but because of how righteous he is. Christ is our chief priest. And something significant always happens when Christ shows up. Now the first time he showed up, he came with humility and he came quietly. Now after about 30 years, he made his presence known and people knew who he was and people knew what he was about. Even the Pharisees, they knew what he was about. And he said he's coming again and he is. And that statement can either be the most wonderful thing you've ever heard or a little bit terrifying depending on where you stand in your relationship with Christ. God is faithful. And God has paid the price for our sin so that we can be with him. So just think about your own life now. Do you expect something significant to happen when Christ shows up in your life? Or do you even allow him to show up in certain areas of your life? I know that sometimes I'm at work and I'm not allowing Christ to actively influence how I work or how I think or how I speak. And maybe when I do, it's half-hearted and I don't expect Christ to really do much. And maybe that's why he doesn't do much because I have low expectations. Or I could expect great things from a great God So that is my challenge to you, is as we celebrate this incredible birth next week, ask yourself, why is it important? Because the whole world doesn't celebrate my birth every year, and the whole world doesn't celebrate your birth every year. They celebrate Christ's birth every year. So just take time this week as you get ready for Christmas. Consider this season isn't about presents or what you're going to get or what you're going to give, but it's what's already been given to us. And that is salvation and eternal life through Christ. And that is why we get to celebrate Christmas every single year. Yeah, let's, let's pray. Father God, I'm just so thankful for your faithfulness in our own lives and for your faithfulness in delivering Christ to us thousands of years ago. And what a precious, precious gift that was and that still is. So Lord, I pray that everybody here in this church tent will consider why do I celebrate Christmas? And Lord, I pray that as we do celebrate Christmas next week, that we do it out of joy because all of these promises that were given to the nation of Israel were all boiled down to that night with your precious son. Lord, thank you for your love for us. 
thank you for the remedy that you provided for all of humanity. And thank you that through Christ, we can be called fellow heirs with him and we get to share in the inheritance that he earned. Because out of his love, he offered that inheritance to us. And we pray all this in your son's holy and precious name. Amen.